So my name is Nancy Nickel, and I am the director at Chester Springs Library in Chester County, Pennsylvania. And in September of 2020, my standard poodle named Mercy was diagnosed with Addison's disease. And I'm like many of you who found that out about this disease just because my dog was severely ill. And care has been a wonderful resource for me and full of support. And I'm really happy to introduce you to Lori Basher. If you don't know Lori, and probably we all know Lori. And she first heard about Addison's disease in 2010 when her Portuguese water dog, Mac, was diagnosed. And that was after she had been telling her vet that something was up with Mac for over a year. She said Mac would have died if not diagnosed and treated in time. And she went on to learn all she could about Addison's. She joined with friends around the world to create care. And she has adopted three other dogs with Addison's. So she is the co-founder and president of the nonprofit organization, Canine Addison's Resources and Education. And along with the CARE Board of Directors and members of the CARE Facebook group, she volunteers her time every day to help those with living with dogs with Addison's as well as helping spread the word and awareness about the disease. So, did I get everything? Anything you need to add? Yeah, thank, thank you so much. And thank you for doing this, Nancy. You are the first library system to do an Addison's Awareness event. So you are a trailblazer <laughs> and we thank you for that. The best way that I could think of to help spread the word for Addison's Awareness Week. So. Oh, it's, it's great and you can tell by the number of registrants that it was a great idea. And we appreciate it very much. Thank you. And I'm very thankful to you too. So we're gonna do a presentation here with, Lori has made a slideshow and she's going to be discussing the different aspects of Addison's disease. And if you have questions, you can drop them into the chat box and then we'll take a little bit of time after a couple of slides and we'll address some of those questions and then we'll move on to the next bit. So the first couple questions we're going to talk about are what at, what is Addison's canine Addison's disease? What are the symptoms to watch out for? And what you should do if your dog has some of these symptoms. Okay, so no, take it away, Lori. Thank you. So okay, and I'll remind people to mute themselves if they can when they're not um, when they come in and when they're not speaking. Um, so we're gonna talk about canine Addison's disease, the great pretender, and hopefully I can work these slides correctly. Let's try and go to the first one. No, oh, there we go. So what is canine Addison's disease? This is a sort of very technical description, but I will put it into plainer words as we move along. So Addison's disease is a chronic endocrine system disorder. Um, it occurs when the adrenal glands fail to produce sufficient hormones required to sustain life. So the adrenal glands fail and the dog gets very sick and in danger of dying if we don't act quickly enough. So that's what it is. I'm going to get a little bit more into um, all the various aspects of it. So this is likely the slide that's the hardest to understand and hopefully the others will be easier. <laughs> so symptoms. Many of you who are, who are in the CARE Facebook group have seen this graphic design of ours. Symptoms are, um, they can be very vague and they can be, they can wax and wane over time. So you might not see all of them. You might not, you might not, you might see you know, uh, somebody has a urine accident when they get excited and then they don't do it again for a month or two. Um, we can see hind end weakness, vomiting or diarrhea, frequent drinking or urina urination, coat changes we hear a lot about, collapse, low heart, heart rate, dehydration, lethargy or exercise intolerance, weight loss or lack of appetite, and tremors or shaking. Um, some of these things, as you can see, like vomiting and diarrhea, um, 
could be any one of a number of things. It could be just a bug or it could be something else. Um, just a lot of these things can be indicators of various diseases. So often the problem is that when you talk to the vet, they're not gonna think right away about Addison's disease. Some aren't gonna think about it at all, which is why we work so hard to spread awareness. Um, and we want people to um, know about this disease and to think to test for it. We've had many people, myself included, who um, end up with $5,000 worth of, 5,000 US dollars for those who are not in the US, um, worth of tests before we get to the test that costs anywhere from $250 to $500. And that's the test we really needed all along. But we've spent thousands of dollars just trying to get to that. Um, and that's really very common scenario that um, because it looks like so many other things, it's not always thought about to test right away for this. So these are the symptoms you wanna watch out for. And if you hear your friend saying, oh, my dog, you know, they're having vomiting, they're having diarrhea, there's some tremors, there's some weight loss, just all these various things. Um, then you start to think about Addison's. Some of these are life-threatening, um, obviously collapse. You have to get your dog to the vet right away. If that happens, but you wanna do it um, before you get to that point, if at all possible. So I'm gonna go to the next slide. Um, and this, this, this graphic design is available on our website. It's available on our Facebook page um, and it's shared widely. So it will be available to you. Um, what, do you what do you do if you see these symptoms? Um, and mute that person who just came in. And, and Nancy, if you can help mute people while I'm talking, that would be great. Um, so the symptoms of Adam, Addison's disease are vague and look like many other diseases. You might not see all of the symptoms. Sometimes what happens is you get a sense that there's something's not right. Um, you can't quite put your finger on it, but something's not right. And that's what happened with my dog, Mac. And that happened for a year. And we were telling the vet there's something not right. Um, but we didn't know what it was. And um, she actually thought that I was being an overworried parent. Turns out that my dog had a life-threatening disease and I was not being an overworry parent. Uh, the symptoms may wax and wane for a period of month or, months or years. Vomiting and diarrhea, as I mentioned, are common and they can be related to something else. If it doesn't resolve, of course, you wanna call your vet and seek their advice um, and use your judgment about some of the other symptoms. Uh, vomiting, diarrhea, it's kind of normal to wait a day or two or however long you feel comfortable. If it doesn't resolve, um, something like collapse is going to require get to the get to a hospital immediately or get to the vet immediately. If it is not diagnosed and treated in time, Addison's disease can be fatal. Um, so it's very important to contact your vet if you see these symptoms. And we have very sadly heard of dogs who don't get treatment in time. And you want to avoid that at all costs, which is why we work so hard to um, to do this kind of work, to spread the, to spread the word. Um, and uh, Nancy, I think this is where I stop. Yes, so we'll turn it back to you. There, there is no questions so far in the chat, so we can continue, but if you do have questions, you can drop them into the chat and then we'll take a, after the next few slides, we'll stop and I can relay those questions to Lori. Great. Okay. That works. Okay, so um, we're going to talk next about uh, what an Addisonian crisis looks like and also how it's diagnosed. So an Addisonian crisis, I keep saying, is a life-threatening emergency. Contact your vet as soon as possible. So it's going to take some, the, the, um, you're not going to see symptoms unless 70 to 75 percent of an organ is destroyed and then you'll start to see clinical symptoms. Um, most dogs in, an, in a true Addisonian crisis will appear very sick, but we've also heard of dogs who are more stoic 
and they don't really show the severe signs at first. Um, so you have to kind of know your dog. And um, if you have a stoic dog that is showing signs, you certainly want to get that dog to a vet. But really any dog who's showing signs, you want to get to a vet as soon as possible. Um, again, if it's not diagnosed in time, it is fatal. It's important to act quickly um, in a crisis, but it's even better if you know the symptoms ahead of time and you can, and you can get to the vet before a true full-blown crisis. Um, right now, it's, uh, I think we're two years into the pandemic and many veterinarians and emergency hospitals are understaffed. They're overwhelmed and they have very long wait times. Um, so it could be five hours before they can even see your dog. So you really don't want to wait too long. Um, and some hospitals are not accepting patients. They have to divert to another hospital. So it's good to call ahead uh, just to make sure. And diagnosis. So the, I talked earlier about there's this test that costs, really depends on where you live. For me, 10 years ago, it was probably $250. I've heard $500. It really depends on both where you live and the size of your dog. So the, an ACTH stimulation test is the only definitive way to diagnose Addison's. Um, and what happens in a CTH stimulation test is they draw blood to get your dog's baseline cortisol reading. And then they um, give a stimulation, uh, something that's supposed to stimulate your dog to produce cortisol. And then they test an hour later to see if that stimulation worked. And if your dog has Addison's, um, they will show no response to that stimulation. And I do have a sample test that I'll show you in a minute. Um, a baseline cortisol test can be used to rule Addison's out, but if your dog fails that test, you need to do the full ACTH stimulation test to see if your dog has Addison's. It is possible to have a low baseline cortisol reading and not have Addison's. And some people are surprised by that, but it is very common to have a low baseline cortisol reading and not have Addison's. Um, any recent steroid use interferes with the ACTH test and can cause a false positive result. So ear meds, eye meds, um, anything like that, or certainly prednisone, anything like that can um, cause a false response on the test. Um, a lot of times people wanna do abdominal ultrasounds. They are helpful for finding uh, if it's something else, but they are not at all helpful in diagnosing Addison's. It's done a lot. If you need to save money and you think it's Addison's, you could skip the abdominal ultrasound. The most important test is the ACTH stimulation test. And here is a sample test. So what I mentioned was they do uh, a baseline. So they test your dog's production of cortisol. Um, and you can see here that the result is less than 0 0.2, which means it's virtually nothing. They give a stimulation, the drug to stimulate the production of cortisol, and they wait an hour and then they test again. So you can see for this dog, both before and after the test, they had no production of cortisol. And this is really a classic um, uh, ACTH test for a dog with Addison's. There are different systems of measurement. Uh, this is one of them. Um, and so there's um, a different one internationally. So in this test, if it's below um, for dogs, if your dog scores below a two in this, system of measurement, then that is indicative of Addison's. If um, internationally, it has to be below 55. Um, so anyway, so this is a clear diagnosis of Addison's. And also they would normally test electrolytes. Um, we'll talk in a little bit about um, 
types of addisons. So in one type, typical addisons, the sodium drops below its reference range, which you can see here, a sodium of 137 in a range that normal would be 141 to 152. Um, the potassium rises above the range. So in this example, the potassium is at 6.9 in a range from 3.8 to 5.3. Chloride is also on the low side in this dog and, and but not below the range. Um, and then the ratio, so you take sodium, you take 137, you divide it by 6.9 and you get the ACT, I mean, the, N, the sodium to potassium ratio, which is 20. A sodium to potassium ratio below 24 means your dog is in an Addisonian crisis and needs um, uh, crisis care uh, to be able to live. If the potassium rises too high, it will stop the heart. So that's why I keep saying it's really, 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 really important that you get um, emergency care um, for your dog. There's two other kinds of Addison's. There's atypical and secondary, and we'll discuss those in a little bit. But in both of those, the sodium and the potassium remain normal. And this, is, this can be a problem for diagnosis. If your dog's sodium is low and the potassium is high, that might trigger a vet to consider Addison's. Um, but if they're normal, sometimes they don't think about Addison's. So it can, they can be normal and it can still be Addison's. It would just be called atypical Addison's. So that is how it is diagnosed. And so we have, wait, we do have a couple questions for you. Um, Deb has a question about the common breeds, but we could wait on that because Lori is going to talk about that. Right. And Robin asks, <clears throat> how does Addison's compare to diabetes? Okay, so that's actually a good example. So they are both endocrine diseases. I'm sorry, I think I'm supposed to stop sharing for questions. Is that right? Yes. Um, so, so both Addison's and diabetes are endocrine system diseases. What happens with type 1 diabetes is that the immune system attacks and destroys its own pancreas. In Addison's disease, the immune system attacks and destroys its own adrenal cortex. So similar process, both are immune-mediated immune diseases where the immune system attacks their own bodies and destroys one of their organs. Does that answer the question? And some dogs, we do see sometimes, um, well, we tend to call them overachievers, dogs who have more than one, um, more than one disease or more than one issue. And um, some dogs we, we will see with multiple endocrine diseases. So some dogs will see with both uh, Addison's and diabetes, some with Addison's and hypothyroidism, um, some with Addison's and megaesophagus. There's various dogs who get more than one disease. Um, one of our concerns, and we'll talk later about the, the um, the um, treatment is that some dogs are giving, given way too much prednisone, which can lead to diabetes. And we've seen that happen. So we're really, uh, really want to be careful about that. I have one more here from Margareta. She says, my dog, along with two other siblings in the litter have been diagnosed with Addison's. And I have one of his litter mates. Is Addison something that can be hereditary? Well, Lori will talk about that. And also, if my other dog doesn't show symptoms, would you recommend anything specific, like any test beyond the ACTH to check for Addison's? So this is um, a, it's a great question. Um, when my dog, Mac, was diagnosed, we had his litter mate bonus. And what they had us do was to do a baseline cortisol for bonus, just to see where he was. He was low normal and he remained low normal for his entire life. From time to time, we would check um, just a baseline cortisol test. Really, now that you know the symptoms, you know what to watch for, but you can also run the baseline cortisol just to check. And 
if that is low, you would move on. If that is below normal, you would move on to the ACTH test. Um, I will talk a little bit about genetics um, in some more slides a little bit later on. Okay, so that's, that's it for the questions for now. We are the next, yeah, Sunshine had a question. And that's also something I'm gonna address yeah. in upcoming slides. Okay, so now Lori's gonna tell us about how Addison's is treated, what can cause it, and is there a genetic test for it? Okay, I'm gonna share my screen again. Okay, so types and treatment. So I have on the screen, if everybody can see it, um, Typical Addison's is the one that I mentioned where the dog fails the ACTH test. So if you fail, if the dog fails the ACTH test, they have Addison's. Um, but then you have to do further testing to decide which kind it is. In some places, they test, they use the ACTH test to test both cortisol and aldosterone. Those are the two hormones that can be related or can be um, affected with Addison's. Some places, but not many, test both. Um, normally what happens is they only test the cortisol through the ACTH test. Um, if that is low, then what you wanna do, which I mentioned earlier, is to test the electrolytes, to test the sodium and potassium. So if, um, if, this, if the dog fails the ACTH test and they have low sodium and high potassium, they're considered to have typical Addison's. Um, that means these are big words. And when I first heard them, I was like, what are these words? So glucocorticoid means um, that deficiency means they cannot produce cortisol. Cortisol is a glucocorticoid. Think of glucose, think of regulating sugar, things like that. A mineral corticoid, think of minerals like sodium and potassium. Um, so the mineral corticoid is called aldosterone. Um, so cortisol is replaced by a very small daily dose of prednisone or one of the other glucocorticoid drugs, um, prednisolone, Meddraw, cortisone acetate, things like that. Um, and very small, we find that most dogs, um, the very rough estimate, and it's always individualized to the dog, is one milligram for a 100 pound dog or a 45 kilogram dog. The aldosterone is what controls sodium and potassium. It is replaced by either a monthly injection of DOCP, and the brand names for that are Procortin or Zycortol. And that is kind of the gold standard of treatment for typical Addison's. They are both drugs that were made for dogs. Um, and it depends where you live. Um, Percortin is not available uh, in Europe, for example. If you're in the UK, <clears throat> you can't get Percortin, um, certainly not easily. Um, so Zycortol is the only drug, uh, is the drug you need to use, <clears throat> um, unless you can prove that you're dog does not do well on Zycortol, and there have been a few. And then there's another drug that was actually made for humans. It's Florinef, or the generic for that is fludrocortisone acetate. That's another way that some people treat it. Um, and um, uh, so, that, so that's another one. The Florinef contains both glucocorticoid and mineral corticoid. So you would only need to give Florinef. Most dogs on Florinef don't need additional prednisone. So basically typical Addison's, um, both cortisol is lacking and you replace that with prednisone and aldosterone is lacking and you replace that either with Percortin or Zycortol or Florinef. And then there's also atypical Addison's. And in that case, only the cortisol is affected. And if I go back to this slide, it's like this second uh, situation in which the sodium and potassium are still normal. 
If that's the case, um, you replace it with a small daily dose of prednisone or another one of the glucocorticoids. Um, with atypical Addison's, it can progress or transition to typical Addison's. Sometimes with this form of Addison's, you see that the dog cannot produce cortisol. Um, but they can still produce aldosterone. Some remain atypical for life, and some go on and develop the aldosterone deficiency. And when that happens, it's called they transition to typical Addison's. And that is something that you would watch for when your dog is diagnosed as atypical. It tends to happen quickly if it's going to happen. Normally in the first few months, it might take up to a year. And we have those special rare dogs who write their own books and they are diagnosed two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road, not 20 years, because dogs don't live that long. But we have a dog who, who, who was, I might have been 10 years later, they transitioned from atypical to typical. And I wouldn't have believed it except that I saw the records myself. It's very unusual though, usually it happens quickly. There's another form of Addison's called secondary Addison's. And in that case, it's also, they're only deficient in cortisol. But the problem in this case is not with the adrenal cortex, which it, so for typical and atypical, the problem is with the adrenal cortex. The immune system has destroyed its own adrenal cortex. In secondary Addison's, it's not the adrenal gland that's the problem, it's the pituitary gland. So the pituitary gland um, cannot create <clears throat> cannot secrete ACTH, which is what tells the body to produce cortisol. So because it can't tell its body to produce cortisol, you need to replace the cortisol because it doesn't make it. Um, again, because it's a pituitary problem, not an adrenal problem. And that form of, of Addison's does not turn into typical Addison's because it's not a problem, <clears throat> excuse me, with, with the adrenal glands. So that's a lot of information and I'll take questions about that in a minute. Um, okay, causes, causes and risk factors. And a lot of this is based on our interview with Dr. Steve Friedenberg from the University of Minnesota. <clears throat> he was very interesting to talk to and to interview. And he said that, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> he said it's really all three of these things together. <clears throat> it is not, <clears throat> so there has to be a genetic predisposition. So that's one part of it. And the precise genetic component is not yet fully understood. There has been research in the past that suggested it was a simple autosomal recessive trait. He said, they can say with 100% certainty that that is not the case. It is not a simple autosomal recessive trait. Um, autosomal <clears throat> recessive trait means that both the sire and the dam need, need to be carriers to pass it on. And he said, it is not that simple. And that's not the case. He said, it is likely a complex trait involving many different genes. Uh, researchers are working on it. Um, he suggests that we may never know, or at least not in his lifetime, and he's a young man. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> but they have been studying this for decades and they're making some progress and that's great. Um, there is no genetic test available, so you cannot, <clears throat> a breeder cannot test to see if their dog would produce it. Um, so there's, there's kind of, since it's not fully understood, it is difficult to breed away from. Um, so there is no test that can say whether you, your dog will produce it. There's also no test to say whether your dog will get Addison's, develop Addison's in the future. Um, <clears throat> and I do have another slide about genetic predisposition. And it can affect, <clears throat> there are certain breeds that are highly represented, but it can affect any breed or mix. In addition to the genetic predisposition, 
there has to be an environmental trigger. The trigger could be internal or it could be external. Um, and it's one of the most challenging and poorly understood components because there are so many possible stressors that could push the failing adrenal glands over the edge and reveal that there is this underlying disease process going on. And I say it could be internal or it could be external. An example of an internal one, um, I about a year ago, I adopted a dog who had Addison's and um, she had just had a litter of puppies and had been weaned off. So for her, her internal stressor, stressor was pregnancy. And so that's, you know, a pretty, a pretty severe <clears throat> stressor, of course. Um, external stressors can be anything. It can be a visit to the vet. It can be, um, uh, depending on where you live, fireworks. You know, there's a lot of fireworks here around the 4th of July and in other countries at other times of the year, <clears throat> excuse me, and that can be a stressor. Uh, we see diagnosis a lot around holidays. So lots of people coming and going, lots of prep, lots of company, lots of excitement, lots of change from the normal routine. And that can be a stressor. <clears throat> um, so going to the vet could be it. You could go to the vet to get a vaccine. A vaccine is a stressor on the body for any dog. Um, but... <clears throat> I'm going to be careful here because just be, so there's correlation doesn't mean causation. So because something happened at the same time, <clears throat> doesn't mean it caused Addison's. So <clears throat> fireworks don't cause Addison's. Having company doesn't cause Addison's. Getting a vaccine doesn't cause Addison's. Things like that don't actually cause Addison's, but what happens is there are stressors on the body. When the adrenal glands are in the process of failing, remember that they said they have to be 70 to 75% failed before you'll start, start to see signs. So that disease process is already going on, and then you throw a stressor on top of it, and it sort of pushes them over, that, over the edge, and then you start to see signs. Um, and sometimes that can happen quickly, and sometimes it happens slowly. Um, hopefully I've given you an idea of what some of the environmental triggers are. And there could be thousands of them. Um, and Dr. Friedenberg is actually doing some research now on, and they're doing an environmental survey for dogs with and without Addison's to see if they can pinpoint some of the common environmental triggers. And the third part is, so you have a genetic predisposition and environmental trigger and an autoimmune response. So remember I said it's an autoimmune, an immune mediated disease, <clears throat> which means for whatever reason, um, the immune system sort of wakes up and says, hey, I'm gonna destroy my own adrenal cortex. And so it's the immune mediated destruction of the adrenal cortex. The adrenal gland has several parts to it, but the only part that's involved in Addison's is the adrenal cortex. Another part, for example, is the medulla, and that is not affected, it's just the cortex. Um, there's parts to the cortex, so there's the part that is responsible for cortisol, there's part that's responsible for <clears throat> um, aldosterone. So um, those, that's the part that's involved. Um, Researchers are trying to discover in their research, they're trying to see if there's a signal from the immune system that indicates it's about to attack its own adrenal gland. If they can figure out, if they could figure that out, then, then they could try and prevent it from happening. And so lots of really interesting work being done throughout the world. Um, we happen to have interviewed Dr. Steve Friedenberg, um, mostly about the genetics of Addison's and that interview is available on our YouTube channel and on our website if you're interested in that. Um, part of what he showed us um, was this study in Sweden. So apparently in Sweden, almost all, dart, all dogs are insured. 
which is very interesting. So they have a large base of data from insured dogs, and they did a study of over 500,000 dogs. Um, this is Dr. Hansen and her team. And they looked at the various breeds. And in this slide, you can see the dashed line down the center. And then you can see the circle and the, and the horizontal line. If the horizontal line touches the dashed line, that is not significant. It's the ones that don't touch the line that are st statistically significant. So you can see that in this study, Portuguese water dogs were 29 times as likely as um, the average dog to develop Addison's. Standard poodles were 17 times as likely. And also on here, bearded collies um, were 7.43% as likely. Cairn Terriers, 3% or three times. Um, Great Danes did not turn out to be statistically significant, although we see a lot of them. And Cocker Spaniels were statistically significant. One thing that is asked is, well, maybe there's not a lot of German short hair pointers in Sweden. So maybe they don't have the data for them. So there may be other breeds that simply weren't common in the Swedish dog population. But this is what they found. In other studies, in other places, you may find some different things, but we know that Portuguese water dogs, standard poodles, bearded collies, Great Danes, Cocker Spaniels, um, Westies, uh, so many dogs are really highly represented, um, even though not all of them are shown here as statistically significant. Um, and although um, it's very common in certain breeds, as I mentioned before, it can be really practically any breed or any mix you can find absence. So it's, um, and so this tells you a little bit more about the genetic component to make it really clear that there is something genetic going on here, even though they don't yet understand what the genetic trigger is, they're working hard on it. So I think that's, that's probably a good place to stop. Don't have any more questions? I think we did, I think I did hear you say that vaccinations weren't a um, trigger. I think that's what Karen's asking. Um, so uh, they are not a cause. They are a stressor. Um, so one of the ways that I like to describe it is you need to have an underlying disease process going on. So one example that I use is that if you take a lighted match and you drop it on dry cement, the match is going to burn out and nothing's going to happen. If you take that lighted match and you drop it on a gasoline spill that's on the cement, then that's going to blow up, right? So the, the gasoline is sort of the underlying disease process that's already going on. You put a vaccine on top of that and then that might cause it to blow. So it's not the cause, but it can be a trigger. So really it's important to understand the difference between a trigger and a cause. Um, <clears throat> and there's not, you know, you think about how many dogs are vaccinated versus how many get Addison's. And there's a very small percentage of dogs who get Addison's, a very large percentage of dogs who get vaccinated. So the data doesn't really support that that would be a cause. But sometimes you do see dogs who get diagnosed after getting vaccinated. And we think that's because it's a stressor on the body that revealed that the adrenal cortex was already failing and that just sort of pushed it over the edge, if that makes sense. So um, another question was, could constant UTIs or medication be uh, some of their causes? And then I guess I would say, is that a chicken and an, or the egg question? So was she getting multiple UTIs because her adrenal glands were failing? Or, you know, so which came first? And it's really hard to say. Um, 
So we don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but um, you said it could help to cause Addison's and I would say it may have helped to trigger Addison's. I don't think UTIs, I don't think there's any data to say that UTIs or medication could cause Addison's. There's just not enough data to say, to say that. I see a lot of questions coming. Yeah, pop down. <laughs> I thought they were. Uh, so let's see. Once a dog is diagnosed with atypical and is stable with medicine, with medications, how often should a dog's blood work be checked? Um, I would say anytime you see some of the symptoms that, that, that are on the uh, symptom chart, or if you, there's something that doesn't seem right, go ahead and test at any time that something seems off. Uh, normally in the beginning, you know, they might test every month for the first three months. They might, you know, then go to every three months for the rest of that first year. And then after that, after the first year, you could test, you know, every six months or once a year, depending on, or, but always if, always test if there's something that seems wrong, something, one of the symptoms you see, um, it's always good to test. And it's, in some ways it's worth it to just rule out. Sometimes if one of my Addison's dogs, they seem like there's something wrong, I'll do an electrolytes test, test just to calm me down. Everything comes back normal. It's like, okay, it's not the Addison's. <laughs> you know, she doesn't need an injection. Um, so that is uh, one way to think about it. Um, and also you can get, most places can run just the electrolytes, just the sodium, potassium and chloride. And that's often less expensive than doing a larger chemistry profile. Some places can't do that. And the, the range of prices for electrolytes tests I mean, I've heard everything from $12 to over $100. It's just an enormous range of prices for an electro electrolytes test. Uh, and then one more question was, since the vaccines that the dogs get can be triggers or stressors, is, there, is it recommended that they be spread out or spaced out when they are administered? Um, yeah, and there's another question above that. So I, I personally, um, since having my first dog diagnosed with Addison's, vaccines are a stressor on the body for any dog, whether they have Addison's or not. Many vets give a bunch of vaccines all at the same time because it's convenient for the parents. Um, you don't have to come in multiple times. For me, I space out the vaccines for all of my dogs, whether they have Addison's or not. I give one at a time. I wait at least two weeks or a month between them when possible. Um, many people prefer to run tighter tests. So you can run a test that says whether or not your dog has coverage. So something like distemper, you could do that for. Um, rab rabies is required by law in most places. So I don't think they would accept titers for that, but um, I ran a titer test for two of my dogs, one with Addison's and one without. The one with, with Addison's did not have enough coverage, so I had to give him the, the vaccine anyway. And the other dog had enough coverage, so he didn't need it. Um, the unfortunate thing about titers is they tend to be pretty expensive. And I think they don't get done a lot because they're more expensive than just giving the vaccine. So you have to have um, the means to run tighter tests, um, but they're a great idea um, if, if they work. And there's another part of that. Uh, okay, see, so the, um, if a dog is gonna be experiencing a stressful situation like being away from home, how can we best prep for that? So each dog is different. Um, some, my dog was, uh, Mac, he was very afraid of fireworks and thunderstorms. Um, and 
I've had other dogs, two other dogs with Addison's, three other dogs with Addison's who did not have that fear. So you have to take each dog, get stressed out by different things. So if you know that your dog gets really stressed out by going to groomer, you can give a little boost of prednisone to handle that. And when we say a little boost, if they're a hundred pound dog and they're getting one milligram, you can either give an extra half milligram or an extra full milligram. So half to double the dose. Um, some dogs are on big doses to begin with, so they don't really need a boost. Many of us rarely have to boost pred for our dogs. Um, <clears throat> many of our dogs do things like hunting and agility and things like that, and they would get a boost, especially dogs who are hunting. Um, but what you look for is, and some people don't boost ahead of time unless they know that that's gonna stress their dogs. So what you look for are things like vomiting, diarrhea, lethargy, lack of appetite, or if the dog just seems off, and if like a power nap doesn't help, then you can, then you know, like, let's boost the pred and see if that helps. And sometimes that will help. Um, we always consider boosting prednisone or um, getting a shot of dexamethasone for something like surgery or medical um, procedures. That would be a situation in which you always want to consider um, boosting the pred or using, out, using an alternative like dexamethasone. Um, so I hope I answered that question. I see one more. When should I do a full, full blood panel? Um, for me, my, my preference is to do a full blood panel once a year for every dog. Um, sometimes for dogs who've been diagnosed with Addison's after a month or two, like you can have many, many um, things on the blood tests to be off, such as the kidney values, um, albumin, various different things are off. A lot of things are off um, at diagnosis. So in a month or so, or a month or two, you might wanna do a repeat just to make sure everything's come back to normal. And usually it does, if the cause of those values was untreated Addison's. Um, but in, once you're past the diagnosis and you, you're well in, into treatment, um, I do it once a year for all my dogs. Um, we do say that testing electrolytes for dogs with typical Addison's should be done at least every six months. And because sometimes the, um, we see changes in the need for medication. Sometimes dogs need less medicine over time. Occasionally they need more. So if you, if you test the electrolytes at least every six months, you have a good, um, you have a good window into where your dog is in terms of their electrolytes. Okay. So now I think we're good to move on. Um, Flory's going to talk to us about the quality of life for the dogs with Addison's and can Addison's dogs live a normal life? Okay. Quality of life. This is the best part. So with proper treatment, dogs with Addison's can do anything other dogs can do, except you don't breed them. Um, in order to get the best quality of life, you really wanna work on the doses of medication. Uh, you really wanna individualize them. Some dogs need more and some need less than other dogs, um, even dogs of the same weight. I had two dogs who were 65 pounds. One needed more medication, the other needed less medication. Um, you really do need to individualize it. And if you join the CARE Facebook group, if you're not already a member, we talk a lot about that. Um, Addison's is a really a tiny fraction of what veterinarians deal with. So it's not typically their area of expertise. And for that reason, CARE provides many, many informational documents on the latest approaches to treatment. So you can take those to your vet and you can say, hey, this is some of what I'm, what I'm learning about Addison's. Here's some of the latest research. Um, we had interviewed Dr. Lang Lua from Michigan State University on his study, his team's study about low dose DOCP. So we provide that and we say, hey, you can discuss this with your vet. All, all changes to medication should be done with the vet. Um, if you're accustomed to Facebook groups, 
Um, there's a lot of advice that's given in Facebook in various groups. And you just need to remember that changing doses of medication should be reviewed with your vet. Um, it shouldn't be done based on what somebody in a Facebook group said. Um, what we do is we suggest advocating for changes and we provide the um, documentation from credible veterinary sources for you to take to your vet and discuss that with your vet. Um, but we definitely um, encourage people to advocate for, the, for their dogs um, to really individualize the approach. Um, and if you're not already on Facebook, come and join us. Um, just look for Canine Addison's Resources and Education. And we have many people there who have dogs with Addison's. We have many people there who have um, a dog of one of the common breeds and they just wanna be aware um, or they just wanna learn. They love dogs and they wanna learn more. And so I have a little bit of a quiz for you on the next slide. So, can you tell which of these dogs has Addison's disease? And you can see they're very active, they're doing agility, they're playing, they're running, they're enjoying life. Um, and it is a trick question because every single one of these dogs has Addison's disease. And what happens is if it's properly treated, the disease becomes invisible. You don't know, like nobody could tell that any of my dogs have Addison's. Um, they just don't know. I mean, in the beginning when they're very sick, you might, you know, you might, you can tell, but once they're properly treated and their medications are adjusted to the best doses for them with the help of your veterinarian, it literally becomes invisible. It can take a while to get there and we're available to help you with that. It can be a lot of work to do that, but, um, you know, we have dogs who do agility and become champions in many different dog sports, um, who, who hunt, who are service dogs, who are you know, any number of things. And, um, you know, it really doesn't hold them back. Um, so it's, when Mac was diagnosed, what the, what the emergency doctor explained to me was, this is my favorite disease to diagnose. And we were like, what? <laughs> and she said, no, it's really the, my favorite disease to diagnose if a dog has to have a disease this is the one to have because they can go on to live completely normal, long, normal lives with Addison's as long as they get the medication that they need. So that is my spiel about Addison's dogs can have great lives and they can be completely normal. Um, with that, uh, we'll, we can take some more questions. And I also just wanna thank you, Nancy, and, and the Chester Springs Library for hosting this webinar for us. Um, it was a great idea to do it. And we hope that more libraries and more community organizations will invite us in to talk. And uh, just thank you for coming up with the idea. That was a great idea. And for doing the work involved in advertising it and promoting it. So thank you for that. You're welcome. We do see a question in the chat, how likely is it for a dog with Addison's to develop any other diseases? Is there any research that has information about that? Um, I don't know the data on, you know, how exactly how likely you are to get another disease. I do know that it can happen, as I mentioned before, we sometimes see, um, Usually the one we hear most is hypothyroidism with Addison's. Um, I would say next to that, the one we hear a lot of is, not a lot of, but some of is diabetes. We also hear about mega esophagus. Um, sometimes that it's called mega E for short. Sometimes mega E symptoms will resolve once Addison's is treated, sometimes it won't. So sometimes you really do have both. Um, I, Every now and then, and I don't think there's any association. Um, I've heard of some of our dogs having dilated cardiomyopathy, which is heart disease. But all of this is pretty rare, small numbers. Um, but it can happen. So I don't think there's any data that says how likely it is to happen. Uh, if there is that data, I, I'm not aware of it. I have a question. Um, 
question for you, Lori. Should we be very vigilant about the sodium intake or the sugar intake that our dogs get through food and treats and things? Um, so if you have a dog with typical Addison's and they are on either Procortin or Zycortol or Flurinef, usually that medication will balance out normal dietary sodium and potassium. So if your dog gets into a whole bunch of bananas and eats them, <laughs> you might want to do an electrolytes test the next day. Um, but normally the medication will help. Um, diet can affect the sodium and potassium. So um, if you have a change in diet where you, you've introduced something that has either a lot less sodium, a lot more potassium, if you're starting to see changes in the electrolytes, then you might want to say, hey, was there any dietary change? Sometimes that could happen, but it's usually everything stays pretty stable. Um, not sure how much sugar would affect it, although we probably don't want to give them bunches of sugar. Okay, here's another question. When trying to reduce the prednisone, how often do you keep trying? They have a 47 pound Portuguese footer dog, lowered from two milligrams daily. She gets symptoms even when lowering only 1.75, I think, on alternating days. I think that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> it is, and it's a fairly common one. Um, so it really depends on the dog. And um, so this is one example that I give. When I was reducing my dog's prednisone, max prednisone, even when I just thought about it and hadn't done it yet, he would start to get soft poop. <laughs> and I would be like, oh. Um, and it was completely unrelated to a change in prednisone because I hadn't done it yet. Um, so we have to remember that dogs have some things that, you know, just normal things that are unrelated to Addison's. Um, if, you know, if you truly see, um, vomiting, diarrhea, lethargy, or lack of appetite when you try to reduce, and it sounds in this case like you, you've reduced slowly and carefully, then it may just be that your dog needs the full two milligrams. Um, it's unusual to need that much, but it's not, it's not, you know, two milligrams for a 47 pound dog isn't terrible. Um, if your dog was on five milligrams daily for life, you may see some unwanted side effects. But if you've tried and you've gone slowly, you know, I would say just, you know, I'm not a vet. I'll say that I'm not a veterinarian. So check with your vet. Um, but um, keep them on two milligrams for a while and try maybe six months down the road and see if their needs have changed. But normally um, vets will reduce up to 50% at a time. Um, if you wanna be more cautious, you could do 25% at a time, again, with permission from your vet. And um, usually we wait at least five days, but usually a week between changes. And there's a lot of talk about alternating doses, you know, the higher dose, the lower dose, the higher dose, lower dose. I don't do that and I don't know any vet who does that, but I know there's a lot of talk about it. Um, it's not gonna hurt, it'll make the process slower, um, but it's usually not necessary. And vets don't normally do it that way. So always ask your vet about pred reductions. There is one more question. Um, do you need to test electrolytes every month before injections? Uh, and if so, how long prior to the injection? Um, so when your dog is first diagnosed, um, and I didn't say a lot about the low dose research for DOCP. So most vets give the standard dose of DOCP, which is 2.2 mg per kg. Um, and that is for 99 or more percent of dogs, that's way too much DOCP. Um, there's research studies, Dr. Langlois and many others, uh, Dr. Claudia Roish in Switzerland, many people throughout the world um, are doing, I won't say many, 
several are doing studies on low dose um, approach to DOCP and finding that dogs don't need the standard dose. And in many cases in Dr. in the MSU study, they, they tested giving 1.1 mg per cake, which is half the standard dose. Those dogs did very well and they were able to reduce even further. Um, so while you're reducing, if you go from the standard dose to the low dose amount, normally then we would test at day 10 to 14 and again at day 25 to 28. Um, just that one time. The manufacturer says to do a test at day 10 every month and day 25 to 28 every month. We just find that um, really testing at day 28-ish is sufficient um, and that'll tell you whether your dog's ready for the next dose or not. And for us, we say ready. Again, we're not veterinarians. I say that just so you know. Um, if we usually wait for the potassium to get up to the middle of the range, um, because if you keep giving more DOCP, it keeps pushing the potassium even lower. So DOCP works by helping dogs to retain sodium, which in turn helps them to excrete potassium. So you keep giving more, you keep pushing the potassium lower and it tends to last. It's supposed to be for a month, but we've seen when dogs get too much, it has this sort of overlap effect where it just keeps the dog. I've seen some dogs have to wait a hundred days for their potassium to get up to mid range. We don't recommend extending the interval unless you're just in the beginning of testing and you're trying to let that excess wear off. Ultimately you want a 28 to 30 day cycle. That's really what the medication was designed for was to give it monthly. Um, but some people do need to let the excess wear off and you, you do it very carefully. Um, so while you're reducing, you do test electrolytes more often, sometimes monthly, um, depending on how you go about it. Um, if you have all the time and all the money in the world and you can test your dog once a week um, after day 28 to see where the potassium is heading, that's great. Um, most people don't have all the money in the world. So come and talk to us in Facebook and we can tell you what to discuss with your vet. Um, but it really depends on where the electrolytes are, where the sodium is, where the potassium is. So it's hard to answer that question. Just give a blanket statement about it. It for questions and we, we have done I think a whole hour here so yeah I think we'll wrap up thank you very much for coming and thank you very much Lori for doing this for us oh you're welcome my pleasure and I will stick around and answer questions if people have them but um thank you so much for doing this and for having us and for helping to spread awareness so uh, this is we are currently in the start of Canine Addison's Awareness Week it's our sixth annual one um, and one of our um, board members, Mary, uh, had the idea to do this, and we've done it every year, and it's been really successful. So thank you for doing this for us. Appreciate everybody for coming. Stop the recording, and then we'll... Um, yeah, I can stop. <laughs> I can find it. There it is.